Mark Rosengarten. Welcome to... Ask Rosengarten. It's time once more for Ask Rosengarten, the show where you ask the questions and I answer them. Because, after all, I'm the guy you're asking. Today's question comes to us from Mary Nevels. She says, Hey, Mark. Hey. Your videos are awesome. Aw. I watched the one on conversions a million times. It takes a lot of time. And it did help me understand more. But you could make, could you make one where you use the powers in the equation, like 55 centigrams to nanograms. Instead of all the zeros, use 10 to the negative ninth. Uh, also, I don't understand how my teacher comes up with some of the relationships between the units. They are not on the chart she gave us, like she just pulled them from nowhere. Like 20, millile 20 milliliters equals how many kilograms? I have no clue. Please help. Um, I don't have enough information for the second part. 20 milliliters equals how many kilograms? No. If I'm assuming that what she's talking about is 20 milliliters of water weighs how many kilograms, then we can do something about that. Otherwise, 20 milliliters equals blank kilograms doesn't really mean anything. You can't convert milliliters to kilograms without having some density in there to uh, do the conversion. But I can certainly show you how to do conversion using scientific notation. Okay, so 55 centigrams is how many nanograms? A nanogram. Do, 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 do. Sorry, I just couldn't resist. So centi is 10 to the minus 2. Nano is 10 to the minus 9. Now, normally I'd say it's a 1 followed by 7 zeros because there's 7 powers of 10 different. But you can also say that instead of saying the 1 followed by 7 zeros, you could also say 10 to the 7th difference. 55 centigrams. And then there's 10 to the 7th nanograms per centigram. So we have to multiply to cancel out centigrams. And this comes out to, well, 55 times 10 to the 7th, which converted to proper scientific notation, would be 5.5 times 10 to the 8th nanograms. It's actually really easy to work it through like this. If it was 155 times 10 to the 7th, well, that would be 1.55 times 10 to the we're making this smaller by 2 powers of 10, so we make this larger by 2 powers of 10. 1.55 times 10 to the 9th. It actually is somewhat easier to do the conversions this way. If it was 3,155 centigrams, then it would be 3.155 times 10 to the whatever. Since we have to make this smaller by 1, 2, 3 powers of 10, we have to make this larger by 3 powers of 10. So doing conversions with scientific notation is actually really easy. In fact, in some ways, it's easier than using the ones with all the zeros after it. Our other question comes today from Paul Rose, who asks, I was wondering if you could explain more about electron pairs and lone pairs and how they affect the shape of bonding. Cheers. Love the series, by the way. It's really helping me get better at my chemistry A-level course. Woo! We're going to just do simple molecules here. When nonmetals bond covalently, it involves their S electrons and their P electrons. And these fan out in a tetrahedral arrangement when forming bonds. Let's say, for example, that we have chlorine. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. Its dot diagram looks like this. So it has a full S sublevel, and it has two full p orbitals and an unpaired electron in its other p orbital. Now, when the two chlorines bond together, the unshared electrons repel each other in both the molecules, forcing it into a linear shape. Then again, there's really no other shape it could possibly have. The lone pairs force it into a linear shape. All right, now let's say we have oxygen. Oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. Two lone pairs and two unpaired electrons. So here are two lone pairs, and here are the unpaired electrons. Now, when oxygen bonds with hydrogen, in that manner, 
hydrogen's orbital overlaps with oxygen's. And this hydrogen will also overlap with oxygen. These are lone pairs in atomic orbitals. These are molecular orbitals, which now belong to both oxygen and hydrogen. But notice what the lone pairs do. They force this water molecule into a bent shape, a bent shape. If we have nitrogen, nitrogen has five valence electrons, one lone pair and three unpaired electrons. One lone pair and three unpaired electrons. So that when hydrogen bonds to it, that lone pair forces the molecule into a trigonal pyramidal form. So this trigonal pyramidal shape comes from that lone pair forcing these hydrogens down in that direction. Otherwise, the molecule would probably be flat, which is called trigonal planar. This isn't trigonal planar because of that lone pair. If we were dealing with carbon, carbon has four valence electrons and no lone pairs. This molecule is forced into a tetrahedral arrangement where all the bond angles are identical. So oxygen's two lone pairs are the reason why water is bent. And because water is bent, it melts and boils at a much higher temperature than it normally would. And it, thanks to those two lone pairs of electrons, water is a liquid at room temperature. If it wasn't, life wouldn't exist as we know it. And finally, a question from YouTube user JAC Soccer 7 as a comment on one of my other tutorials. In a pyramidal molecular arrangement, one alone electron pair, will the overall polarity of the molecule be polar? And why? Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Yeah, the polarity of the molecule will be polar. Here's why. Okay, here's a structure of this pyramidal molecule once more. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1 and nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3.0. So in each of these bonds, the electrons from the hydrogen are being pulled more towards the nitrogen side of the molecule. Now, if this was a tetrahedral molecule and there was another bond up here pulling down with exactly the same strength, the whole molecule would be nonpolar but there is no counterbalancing pull from this side. All of the pull is in toward the nitrogen on three of the four sides. It's an asymmetrical electron distribution. What that means is the distribution of electrons is not equal throughout the molecule. Because the nitrogen side gets more use of the shared electrons, the nitrogen side is partially negative. And the hydrogen side is partially positive. This gives you a dipole moment up in that direction. This molecule is a polar molecule. Keep sending in those questions and I'll keep answering them. AskRosengarten at gmail.com. What are you waiting for? Ask Rosengarten.